for the lovely, lovely introduction. And I can't tell you how excited I am to be here because thinking about oligonucleotides as a therapeutic is something that one always sort of has hoped for. And seeing it materialize is just so incredibly uh, satisfying. So I'm looking forward very much to um, some of the talks that are coming up. Um, my lab, as you've just heard, has for decades, basically, uh, worked on non-coding RNAs. And as the uh, title here implies, these can be encoded not only by cellular genomes, but also by viral genomes. And in both cases, the question is the same. What are they doing? With respect to cellular non-coding RNAs, I think they could be doing virtually anything and regulating it that a cell does. Uh, in the case of viral non-coding RNAs, I think the scope is a little bit more restricted because viral genomes are small, and if it's going to devote precious space to making a non-coding RNA, that RNA ought to be doing something important for the virus. So you can think that maybe it's contributing in some important way to the viral life cycle, or that it's assisting the virus in uh, the counteroffensive of the defenses that the host organism is raising against the viral infection. An another thing to remember is that viruses and cells are constantly exchanging genetic information. And so what this has meant is that some non-coding RNAs made by viruses look very similar to ones made by host cells. On the other hand, that doesn't mean they're carrying out the same function, because viruses are very clever. They acquire these pieces, and then they do further things with them in order to satisfy their own needs. So the story that I've decided I want to tell you today actually has to do with RNA triple helices, and that started with our investigations of a viral non-coding RNA. Uh, so what I want to do is give you a little bit more introduction to non-coding RNAs. You all probably know this, but it's, I always feel it sort of ties the talk together. Um, and then I'm going to go back to when we ran into RNA triple helices and sort of follow the storyline and then tell you about some very, very, um, I think, revealing studies that have just been published uh, that have, I think, understanding of evolution impact. And again, that's something that looking at both viral and host encoded non-coding RNAs has the potential to do. So I always love to start with what I think is a wonderful slide from John Maddock, who is the uh, Australian bioinformaticist. And what he's done here is to compare Plot over here the amount of non-coding DNA in various genomes, the fraction, versus a whole bunch of organisms that you can't, of course, read. And um, with the result that, or with the conclusion that the ratio of non-coding RNA rises as a function of developmental complexity, which is sort of a mystical term, but everybody here knows what, what I'm talking about. So, what you see here, all the blue guys down here are single-celled bacteria, either eubacteria or archaebacteria. And you see that they have at most about 15 percent non-coding DNA. The organisms here are single-celled eukaryotes, like yeasts, more non-coding DNA. Uh, in this range, we have um, invertebrates and plants, yet more non-coding DNA. And finally, as you know, once we get up to animals, mammals, uh, and humans, we have a whopping 98 percent or so non-coding DNA. But I think an even more striking realization that's really been occurred in the last 10 years is that virtually all of this non-coding DNA at some time in the life of the organism is probably made into RNA. But just because these molecules can be perhaps very short-lived or very low in abundance doesn't mean they can't be doing important things in terms of cell signaling, regulation of various processes. And that's, of course, what we want to know about with respect to function. And over the years, and you heard some of this in this lovely introduction, 
we have identified the role of many non-coding RNAs uh, and what they do in gene regulation. You heard mention of the snRNAs uh, in the SNRPs that are the building blocks of the spliceosome, using base pairing to recognize the ends of introns and build a spliceosome that then splices out uh, introns. But there are also non-coding RNAs involved in the regulation of transcription, like the 7SK RNA. In the nucleolus, there are two major kinds of so-called snow RNAs, small nuclear RNAs, that again use base pairing to identify certain locations in ribosomal RNA and insert very specific modifications that we're now learning are more and more important for regulating translation by ribosomes. In germ cells, we have pi RNAs that keep um, transposons, in, in part, keep transposons from moving around and racking havoc uh, with genomes. And you all know that, you know, every journal you open has at least one new paper on some long non-coding RNA that associates with a protein complex and associates with chromatin to either uh, turn it on or turn it off in the, in the um, general region uh, where it binds. Uh, once we go out to the cytoplasm, there are, of course, the classical non-coding RNAs, the ribosomal RNA and the tRNAs that make translation happen. And uh, there's also siRNA, the experimentalist tool, but also the tool we're talking about here because of its potential for therapeutics. And finally, microRNAs, and you know that there are perhaps as many as a thousand of these tiny little 22 nucleotide RNAs in cells. And what they do is associate with specific proteins and then use uh, partial complementarity with messenger RNAs, usually in the 3' UTR, uh, to both uh, modulate uh, translational efficiency and to affect the stability of the mRNAs. And thus, they're very important in development, differentiation, disease, and so on. So let me just make a couple of additional comments here. Um, first, in virtually all these cases, the non-coding RNA is associated with tightly bound proteins, and very often, perhaps always, those proteins play a really important role in the function of non-coding RNAs. Um, and secondly, I've already mentioned that in several cases we know that base pairing between the non-coding RNA and its target is very important for its function. But this is, of course, just the tip of the iceberg. And as I mentioned, you know, all sorts of new non-coding RNAs are, are popping out on a daily basis, primarily because of advances in sequencing technology. So finally, I want to introduce, because as I mentioned, uh, the story I want to tell you today starts with a viral non-coding RNA. I want to introduce you to the viral non-coding RNAs we've been studying in my lab, actually, since 1981. Um, they come from the gamma herpes viruses, and their names are listed here. Uh, gamma herpes viruses have long, double-stranded DNA genomes. They encode about 100 different proteins on average. Uh, they are lymphotropic, meaning they infect T cells or B cells. They're all oncogenic. And they all have both latent states and lytic states. So in the latent state, the, the viral uh, DNA sort of disappears into the cell. A few genes are transcribed, and the virus waits for conditions to change. We don't know that much about that until they come out and start producing virus during the lytic phase. So what you notice from this slide, so the names of the non-coding RNA or RNP are shown over here, along with the dates of their discovery. And by comparing these dates with the number of question marks that remain over here, uh, you can deduce that finding functions for non-coding RNAs is quite a challenge. It's very difficult, and it takes a long time to get anywhere. Uh, but just recently, I think the last five years, there's been a real uptick in our rate of being able to assign functions, and that's because technology has finally caught up. And nowadays, we can find associations between non-coding RNAs and their bound proteins and other RNAs, chromatin, et cetera, much, much more easily. And that really sends us off in the right direction. 
Okay, so the story I'm going to tell you today has to do, starts with this pan RNA, the polyadenylated nuclear RNA made by KSHV. And actually, I'm not going to be telling you about its function because we don't really yet know its function. Uh, I think we're closing in on that. But what I am going to be telling you about is an RNA element that was found in that RNA that has now sort of expanded into the far corners of biology. And that is an RNA triple helix. So let me go back and start with a little bit more introduction to KSHV and the pan RNA, the polyadenylated nuclear RNA. Uh, you probably know that KSHV uh, causes cancers and lymphoproliferative lymph lymph disorders in immunocompromised individuals like those are, who are already suffering from HIV. And it causes these ugly sarcomas. In the lytic phase, this virus produces this RNA, polyadenylated nuclear RNA. It was discovered in the mid-90s, both in my colleague George Miller's lab at Yale and in Don Ganim's lab at UCSF. Uh, PanRNA resembles a messenger RNA. It's about a kilobase long. It's transcribed by Paul II. It's capped and polyadenylated, just like mess pre-messenger RNAs. Um, but as far as we know, although there's a little bit of controversy about this recently, um, the vast majority of it is never exported to cy the cytoplasm. There are no conserved open reading frames. So it's a nuclear RNA. And what's remarkable is that it accumulates to about half a million copies per infected cell. And therefore, as this little diagram shows, it accounts for up to 80% of the polyadenylated RNAs in the lytically infected cells. So there's huge amounts of this. So it's got to be doing something important. Um, but what I'm going to tell you about is an element called the E&E &E for element for nuclear expression that's near the 3' prime end that's necessary for it to accumulate to this very high amount. And that element was first worked on by Nick Conrad, uh, who was a postdoc in my lab. He now has his own lab at UT Southwestern. And by the time Nick finished in the lab, uh, we knew that this was the structure of the element that was necessary for this high accumulation of the pan RNA. Uh, and based on both biochemical experiments and, um, and um, in vitro experiments, Nick had come up with a model for how he thought the E and E would in fact stabilize the pan RNA of which it's a part. And the idea was very simple. We know that normally the first step in decay is to chew off the poly A tail and then chew, chew up the rest of the RNA. So the idea was that this element with its U-rich internal loop here would bind, would base pair with poly A RNA the poly A tail, and therefore stabilize the RNA against degradation. And we were very excited when we realized that the structure here looks exactly like the interaction of one of the snow RNAs, the box HACA snow RNA, with its ribosomal RNA substrates. Um, and therefore, we thought this has to be what's really going on here. This has to be the way it looks. Now, of course, that turned out not to be true. Uh, which we found out several years later when Rachel Mitten Fry, who was the next postdoc to take up this problem, came to the lab and was successful in getting uh, crystal structure of the core E and E bound to oligo A9. That's my oligo contribution in my lecture. Uh, so. Um, so what, sh what her structure revealed was that it didn't look like a snow RNA interaction at all, but that this E and E is really forming a triple helix, and that's what's important for clamping the poly A tail and stabilizing the pan RNA. And she did this with a lot of crystallographic help from Tom Stites' lab. So, I'm just summarizing here. So the model certainly is not that. What happens instead is that there are five major group triple helical interactions that are formed by the oligo A9 with those U's that were in this internal loop. And then there's extension by A minor interactions into the lower stem of the E and E. So this is what it looks like in 3D. Um, 
for those of you who have an easier time looking at 2D pictures like me. Um, the Oligo A9 forms standard Watson-Crick uh, base pairs with the U's over here. They're extended by Hoekstein interactions with the U's on the other side of the loop and then further extended by these A minor interactions. So let's take a slightly closer look at this major groove triple helix. Uh, this is what it looks like. So you see U, A, U, U, A, U, U, A, U, et cetera. Looking down on it, just to remind you, here's the standard Watson-Crick interaction extended by the Hoogstein interaction. And I want to call your attention, because this is going to become important later in my talk, to the fact that the two prime hydroxyl of the Hoogstein strand in this triple helical stack um, is within hydrogen bonding distance of a phosphate on the, the A-rich strand. And as I said, remember that because that's going to become important later on. It turns out that these, these five triples that are stacked on top of one another are almost perfectly um, identical. And what, so as you see here in the overlay, um, and what's particularly satisfying about that is that back in 1957, Gary Felsenfeld, David Davies, and Alex Rich predicted exactly this structure for the UAU triple. And that was based on their studies of poly, two strands of poly U binding to a strand of poly A and using helical diffraction to study the structure. But what that makes even more curious is that at the time that Rachel's structure was, was, was found and she published it, it was the longest stretch of triple helis as triple helical interactions that had yet been identified in any naturally occurring RNA. And yet it was discovered way back in 1957. So there must be others, where are they? And that's basically what the rest of my talk is going to be about. What do they look like? Um, let me just quickly say that the A minor interactions that extend the triple helix of the E and E with the poly A tail, um, those are very common tertiary structures in RNA. Quarter of the A's in the ribosomal large subunit engage in them. There are three different types. We have examples of all three types here. So Rachel had a structure, but was it really important in terms of stabilizing RNA? And what she realized was uh, Nick previously had made mutations in those U-rich, that U-rich internal loop, and found that changing uh, U's, to A, U's to C's were debilitating in terms of the stabilization conferred by the element. Those are the positions there. And because she knew that a CGC base triple was isosteric with a UAU triple, the obvious experiment was to try to introduce into the poly A tail a single G residue and see whether that could suppress the effect of the two U mutations. And the next slide I want to show you, turns out that you can just pop RNA into a nuclear extract and do an in vitro assessment of the survival of the RNA. And what I'm showing here is that if you have an E and E uh, in, in a short RNA, pictured here, uh, that you get some survival of the RNA all the way up to 60 minutes, whereas if it's deleted, or if you have this double C mutation, um, there's pretty much no full length remaining after 60 minutes. On the other hand, when Rachel put a single G residue into the poly A tail of 60 nucleotides, either very close to the far end or sort of in the middle, then she saw incredible stabilization of the poly A tail of a certain length, meaning that the E and E was sort of scanning along this whole poly A tail and picking out of that C of A's, the single G residue, and clamping in and making the CGC uh, triple there, and therefore giving you both more and a more defined product in the uh, nuclear extract, which of course has all sorts of nucleases in it, which is the basis of this assay. So what I've told you about this early work then is that 
Uh, the E and E is an RNA element that protects pan-RNA. Uh, in the crystal structure, it interacts with the oligo A to form these uh, major groove triples and the three additional A minor interactions. Uh, and it appears to be functionally important for stabilizing the RNA because of this experiment that I just told you about. So that raised the question, do other viruses, there must be other viruses that make pan-RNAs that have E and E's in them to stabilize them. And also, where did the virus get this structure? Presumably, there would be in some cellular RNAs or cellular non-coding RNAs E and E-like structures that would also protect those RNAs in the nucleus from nuclear decay pathways. So let me tell you quickly about this, and then I'm going to go on and spend a bit more time about uh, cellular E and E's before I come to the, the final part of my talk, which is the sort of interesting evolutionary part. So we'd, of course, been looking for triple helices in RNAs, but we didn't really know how to search until the triple helix was actually found. And at that point, Kaziu Tukowski, a research uh, scientist in the lab, was able to take the programs and build in the right descriptors so that we could actually begin to find additional E and E's. And those, of course, included that there would be an internal loop, that there would be some GCs as receptors for the A minor interactions, that there would be a, a stem loop on top, et cetera, et cetera. And he also realized that the structure could also exist upside down and just have the Watson-Crick base pairing occur with this strand and that be the Hoogstein strand, and that would work just fine. Um, and doing this, then he searched the viral database and he found lots of other, e not lots, but some other E and E's, and most of them are shown here. Um, what you notice is that the ones that are from DNA viruses are all just upstream of a poly A signal, so they're close to the poly A tail, so they can grab it and interact and stabilize it. Um, one of these, though, was actually in an RNA virus, uh, which n no place during its replication cycle actually enters the nucleus. So this was one of our first indications that um, that cytoplasmic RNAs can also be protected from degradation by this E and E element. And two of these are RV rhesus radinovirus and equine herpes virus 2 are very closely related viruses to KSHV. And I just want to show you in the next slide, because this is sort of fun, that at the time we found the E and E's in, in these genome structures, no pan-RNA had been identified from either RRV or EHV2. Uh, but the fact that there's an E and E there, and these are where they're in centenic locations relative to the surrounding genes, predicts the existence of pan-RNAs in these other viruses. And in the case of rhesus radinovirus, I won't show you any data, but we went in and we found that there was indeed a pan-RNA about a KB long. Uh, with an E and E to stabilize it. Uh, so the conclusions then of this, this short uh, part of the work are that they're relatively rare, but they do occur in evolutionary divergent viruses. Um, many gamma herpes viruses appear to express RNA panhomologs, centenic positions, almost no sequence homology for the KB length of the RNA. It's all structural homology in this E and E element just upstream of the poly A tail. So what that suggests is that if we had good programs that could predict the presence of these structurally conserved elements, we would have a good way of looking for homologs. But we're still groping with how to actually search for them. And I'll come back to that. So what about cellular E and E's? So it turns out that meanwhile, uh, what had been going on was characterization of two now very famous long non-coding RNAs uh, in very highly conserved invertebrates, a uh, one called MALLET1 for metastasis-associated lung adenocarcinoma with transcript 1, and the other called MEN-beta, um, which is also the same as the NEAT RNA that's a component of paraspeckles.
And I know that you'll be hearing a bit more about Mallet One from David Spector, uh, so be sure to come to his talk. What these RNAs have in common with the pan RNA of KSHV, non-coding, intronless, made by Paul II, highly abundant, or can be highly abundant, they're nuclear, and their exact functions are still unknown. Uh, what had been discovered by Jeremy Willits when he was a graduate student in David Spector's lab at Cold Spring Harbor was that the three prime end of these two RNAs, although it's made originally with a poly A tail, like all Paul II transcripts, these get cleaved because there's a tRNA-like structure which then serves as a target for RNAs P, creating a three prime end which has an A-rich stretch at its terminus. And what was realized by both us and by um, Jeremy Willits, who then later on went to Phil Sharp's lab, was that that enabled the possibility of folding back this A-rich tract onto the e, what looked like an E and E type structure and forming what would be longer stacks of triple helices, but with this funny interruption in the middle. In other words, a CGC, which I've already told you about as a triplet, and a CG base pair. Uh, and what happened first was that both Jess Brown, a new postdoc in my lab, and Jeremy Willits did various mutational studies that were consistent with these structures forming. Um, and Jess, in addition, did thermal melting and got data, that, again, consistent with these longer triple helices forming. Uh, Jess, however, wanted real proof in terms of the structure. And so she went on to get crystals and solve a 3.1 angstrom structure of the mallet one, uh, tri this bipartite so-called triple helical structure, uh, again with uh, help from the Stites lab. Uh, David Bookley was a graduate student, and so Jess Brown and Max Valenstein, an undergraduate in the lab. Okay, so what Jess solved the structure of then was a somewhat truncated mallet one E and E. So here's the terminal A rich track coming up and pairing very nicely here. Um, and here's a tetra loop that she stuck in and a little module for uh, binding heavy metals to self help solve the phase problem. And what I just want to point out is that if one looks at the um, accumulation of a fragment from the three prime end of mallet one RNA, um, that this core that she solved the structure of is virtually as stabilizing as the wild type E and E. Uh, but if you make this just one U to C mutation, which just would destroy this upper part of the triple helix, it has a devastating effect both on the wild type uh, E and E and on this piece that she, formed, she solved the structure of. Okay, so what does the structure look like? Well, it looks like it was predicted to look, except now that we, we know that on top of this stack of UAUs in the bottom triple helix, there is a CGC that stacks on top, and then there's a CG doublet, and then we continue on. And up above is a stem, and down below are two A minor interactions, uh, and then more of a stem. And I just want to show you here if I can get this to work. Um, rotate this thing around. And the only point of rotating it around is if you squint your eyes, this just looks like you know a nice helical, regular helical structure. You don't see the fact that there's this interruption in the middle where you have the CGC and the CG doublet. Um, so so what, what is really going on and how is this contributing to the structure and the stabilization ability of the structure? Um, one thing that the CGCs and the, and the doublet are probably doing is increasing the base stat stacking because it just turns out that um, Gs and Cs stack better than Us and As. Another thing that happens at this point is that the direction of the local axis of the helix is, is changed, so it sort of straightens it out, and that may be important for its, for its biological function. 
But the really important thing comes back to that putative hydrogen bond that I mentioned to you earlier, namely the fact that you can potentially form a hydrogen bond between the two prime hydroxyl of the, um, of the um, coosine strand and the uh, backbone phosphate of the A-rich strand. And what you notice here is that those distances turned out to be slightly different at two different points in the crystal structure of the mallet one um, E and E. And what Jess noticed as she started at the bottom and looked at the putative length of that hydrogen bond was it started out quite big, and as you proceed up the triple helix, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then when you get to the interruption, all of a sudden there's a reset it gets bigger again, and then gets smaller. And what this prompted her to do was some model building. So the question was, could she take this pack of six triples and elongate it by one, and what would happen? So basically what she did was to put another CGC up there and ask in this model building exercise what would actually happen. And what she discovered is that you can't do that because this hydrogen bond potential gets too short. So there's just a steric collision there. And that's what we think um, is interfering with the ability to make a triple helix that's longer than six, six triples. And I should also mention that the longest one that's been identified in any RNA so far in Julie Feigen's lab from a telomerase from Cuviramyces or something like that is five UAUs and a CGC on top. So what this says is that the reason that you need that interruption is that structurally you just can't extend a triple helix any further without steric crash. And therefore you need to have some sort of an interruption and this is the way this particular structure has solved this problem. Um, I want to just mention um, a little bit about how we assess the stabilization activity of triple helices. Uh, it turns out that we have a reporter, which is basically a beta globin gene, from which the introns have been removed. And it's been known since the 1980s in Paul Berg's lab that if you remove the introns from beta globin, the transcript just disappears in the nucleus. And you can see this here. Here's lacking the two introns of beta globin. But if you put an E and E in, you can restore that, you can rescue it, which is what's shown here. So that's our reporter assay for measuring the ability of ENEs to restore um, stability. And what's been done here is to make all sorts of mutations in this critical um, juncture place. And you can see that almost none of them are able to give stability to this reporter. Uh, some interesting ones here are adding nucleotides onto the three prime end, which are destabilizing, but you still get some RNA. And the really interesting one, I mean, we think that's happening just because that gives nucleases a chance to grab on and start degrading. Uh, but one that we really don't understand is if you just remove that terminal A residue, then it's very, very destabilizing. We don't understand that at all, why, that, why that's happening. So this is then, you know, in vivo in transfected cells, cells transfected with this reporter. So in conclusion then, uh, about this part of the talk, um, you can have up to nine base triples in, in the element, uh, but in the middle you have the interruption making it a bi bipartite element of the CGC and the CG doublet. Um, the, the role of these is to lock the register of the triplex to form a blunt end, and I've just shown you how important it is to have a blunt end up against the upper uh, double-stranded bit, uh, and there are other things they do. But the real reason for having that interruption is to reset the triple helix so that you can start over and make more base triples in the structure. And the stabilization of the reporter depends on all these same things that the CG nucleotides do. Okay, so at this point, 
we were, of course, searching and searching. We didn't believe that there were only two triple helical elements in all of vertebrates, uh, namely the mallet one and the membeta non-coding RNAs. And we, of course, were searching for more. And at that point, Kazio Tukowski began searching the entire eukaryotic genome for these elements. And he did find something. This was rewarding. Uh, he found thousands of these E and E elements, but almost all of them in plant and fungal genomes. Turns out they're thousands because they are actually in transposable elements, and you know they're multi-copies of transposable elements, so lots of them are identical, although they're about 200 different sequences, and they're all of the type where they bind the poly A tail, like the pan E and E that can sort of slide along and get, get clamped. So the question at this point is why are they prevalent in these particular organisms in plants and fungi? And it turns out that the answer to that, we think, and this is what I want to tell you about in this last part of my talk, is that they compensate for intron loss over evolutionary time in these transposable elements. And this is the work of Kajio and my super main technician in the lab, Mady Shu. Okay, so first of all, what do these thousands of E and E's that are now, and we now know are in plant and fungal transposable elements look like? Well, they look like we expected them to look. There's an internal loop with U's in it and the possibility for making a, a a minor interactions with GC base pairs. Lots of these have a sort of curious destabilized portion there. Some of them are right side up, some of them are upside down. Um, but we also found lots of double domain E and E's. So not just one potential, ones with not just one place where you could potentially form a triple helix with the poly A tail, but also others, uh, another region, and sometimes those are in the same orientation, sometimes they're in opposite orientations, and sometimes it's sort of ambiguous about what the orientation really is, because this one looks like it could go either this way or this way. If you line up a lot of these, and this is just you know, part of the sort of incredible uh, database that Kajio has now compiled, it turns out that this lower E and E, uh, so the red are the conserved nucleotides, this lower E and E, and e domain is more conserved and longer than the upper um, E and E domain, but the important thing here is you never have more than four or a potential for four or five UAU base pairs, or UAU triples. So, I mean, that fits with our earlier conclusions that you certainly can't do more than six because it's just structurally unacceptable. And finally here, um, if you think about how these, uh, these uh, double domain E and E's interact with the poly A tail, the ones that are in the same orientation could do this, but this sort of weird class could do, the poly A could be coming down here and then continuing on, or it could switch over and then be, be engaged in the opposite direction uh, by the lower, lower part of the domain. Okay, so do, are, are these really stabilizing? We pop them into our beta globin reporter, a number of them, and indeed, you see um, an increase in beta globin. This is just a nonspecific band up here, uh, if they were inserted in the forward but not the reverse orientation. And the aspects of them that we noted to be conserved, like the internal U-rich stretches and the potential for making uh, A minor interactions, then if you mutate those, you see that you lose the stabilizing ability. But to get back to the question of why are they in transposable elements and why are they in these particular species of organism, um, let me remind you of what we know about transposable elements. So there are three major classes of transposable elements. They're DNA transposons that move by having the transposase cut the double-stranded DNA at both ends and basically pick it up and put it into a, a foreign site. And then, as you know, they're also 
ones that move via RNA, they make a copy of the RNA, which is then transcribed, or reverse transcribed into DNA, and of the, that, those divide into two classes, the non-LTR and the ones that have long terminal repeats, like the um, RNA retroviruses. And where we fi we're finding these ENEs was in the DNA transposons and in the LTR retrotransposons. So, and here's, here's a pie chart illustrating the distribution. So here are the retrotransposons like Gypsy and Copia, a few in the DNA and almost none in the non-LTR retrotransposons. So where are the ENEs in the uh, LTR and non-LTR uh, retrotransposons? It turns out that they are very close to what would be the three prime end in these cases, since the poly A signal isn't very highly conserved in plants and fungi, it's difficult to tell where the, what really is the poly A signal and where the poly A really would start. But these are about in the right place. Okay. So why are they prevalent in transcripts from uh, transposable elements, but not so much in other cellular mRNAs or long non-coding RNAs? And we think that that has to do with the fact that these transposable elements are undergoing horizontal transfer. And it turns out that horizontal transfer, you know, the, the putting of nucleic acid from one cell into another cell, um, occurs much more frequently with the DNA transposons and with the uh, LTR retrotransposons than with the non-LTR retrotransposons, so that fits. But then it still doesn't inform us about why in plants and fungi. And we think the answer here is, and the last little bit, I just want to give you a little bit of evidence, is that these particular organisms have a mechanism for transposon silencing via an siRNA-mediated pathway. And here we were inspired by a beautiful paper that came from Hitton Mahani's lab at UCSF a couple years ago. Uh, where in Cryptococcus, they discovered that if spliceosomes stall or don't get made so they can't carry out splicing, what happens is that a multi-protein complex called scanner and the branching enzyme take over and enable the production of double-stranded RNA that then gets diced to siRNAs and those go back and destroy the message on which you have the stalled spliceosomes. Okay? So what I've just told you in a little bit more is in this slide. So if you think about it, after horizontal transfer, a transposon might find itself in an environment where all the splicing components don't quite fit with its particular introns, and therefore, it's likely that splicing would go awry, and you might create these stalled spliceosomes. And then you get this siRNA-directed silencing. So the evolutionary pressure here would be for these transposons to lose their introns. But once they lose their introns, as I've already shown you, if transcripts don't have introns in the hostile environment of the nucleus, they get degraded. So one way that they could prevent getting degraded would be then to pick up an E and E element if they've lost their introns. And this is all, you know, evolutionary hokey pokey, but uh, we think this is what's going on. So what you'd like to do at this point is to look at all these transposable elements and ask, do they have introns? Do they have E and E's? And what you would predict is that all the ones that had lost their introns might have E and E's, or all the ones that picked up E and E's had lost their introns. Now, unfortunately, um, the annotation of all these transposable elements is not such that you can do it with all of them. But the one class of them that you can do it with are the DNA transposons, because they're Basically, their messenger RNAs encode a single ORF for the transposase itself that has conserved elements in it, 
And here this is well enough defined so you can tell whether or not it has introns. And so if you look at the phylogeny over here of these transposable elements in these DNA, uh, sorry, of the introns in these transposable elements, it turns out that if they don't have an intron, they all have E and E's. If they do have introns, they never have E and E's. Uh, and sometimes they have E and E's with, with, wait, there's one example here that's sort of an outlier. Uh, let's see, if they have introns, they don't have E and E's. If they don't have introns, they do have E and E's. If they have introns, they do, yeah, okay. Anyhow, um, so certainly all of these fit the rule that if you've lost your intron, you've got an E and E to pick up to uh, protect yourself against nuclear decay. So what you might say looking at this chart is, well, all of these organisms are related. It could be that this happened once and then it was just propagated during evolution to all these other species. But there is one other example down here of uh, organism that has lost its intron, but that has an E and E in, um, in uh, these transposase mRNAs. So we think that's pretty good evidence that probably this, this story that I've been painting for you probably is why we find E and E's in the transposable elements in these particular species, because they have this mechanism for getting rid of stalled spliceosomes, which is likely to happen after horizontal transfer of these elements. So the final conclusion then is um, E and E's can be found in mRNAs, here they're in transposase, transposase genes as well as in non-coding RNAs. Um, everything we know so far um, in these, these new uh, transposon E and E's, it's never longer than five, but we do have examples of being six, but never longer than six. And we think that the reason that they are where they are is that E and E's are counteracting the negative effects of intron loss in these transposon RNAs. So meanwhile, we still don't believe that in all of vertebrates, and actually there are some examples in stickleback fish in the transposable elements of pan-like E and E's, but beyond that, we haven't found any. Um, so what we think is going on and what we're trying to do now, and this is my very last um, real slide, is that there may be triple helices that have non-canonical triples in them. And of course, that makes them very, very difficult to predict by any sort of algorithm. And we have to find out what these non-canonical triples are. And the reason we think they exist is that people who've been doing structures of riboswitches, telomerase, et cetera, have found very good triples that aren't either UAU or CGC and we need to know what those are. So we've done two things. Um, one is to take one position in the mallet, one E and E, and substitute into it all possible triple combinations and ask which are acceptable and which are destabilizing. And from that, we can build, um, build that into our al search algorithms. And also, um, uh, say, a Tarabi, a postdoc in the lab, is doing CLEX on the mallet one structure trying to select stabilizing elements and seeing whether some of those that we pick up have non-canonical base triples in them, because we really expect there will be more. So stay tuned. So in the very end, I just want to thank, you, thank the people uh, whose work I've told you about, uh, Rachel Mitten Fry, who started all of this in terms of the triple helix, is now teaching at Denison College uh, in Ohio. Kajio luckily is still in the lab, as is May D. Uh, Jess Brown just moved to an assistant professor position at Notre Dame in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. And Max Valenstein is a um, MD, PhD student at Harvard. And I want to thank all of our funding sources, and particularly my virology friends at Yale, uh, without whom we wouldn't have been able to work on viral non-coding RNAs at all. And I want to thank you all for um, your attention and hope that there will be lots of questions. Thank you.
Hi, um, Melissa. <laughs> hi. That was a spectacular talk. Uh, I have two questions. One is, how does having an ESE affect the protein output of the mRNAs? And then secondly, it almost seems as though the introns and the ESCs are mutually exclusive, as though if you have an intron, it would be not be beneficial to also have an ESE. So do you have any thoughts on that? Okay. So the person who's really looked into the effect on translation of ENEs is Jeremy Willits, who I'm sure you know, who's now at University of Pennsylvania. And what he found was that having an E&E in, in a reported construct making GFP, in fact, upped the translation. Uh, we have not seriously looked at that, um, what the role is in the cytoplasm, although it's clear that for these transposon mRNAs that have E&Es, um, there must be some benefit to having them. Um, now, uh, your other question was... The, the mutual exclusivity. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think there was... Anyhow, there was, there was there one was anomaly one. Yeah, in that chart. One. Maybe yeah. we should go back to it and see if we can find it. Um, no, the, the one, the, the There's anomalies one that's are, zero. Are There's zero, one, zero. Here, here we yeah. go. That's, that's the anomaly. Yeah. Sorry, I yeah. couldn't find it earlier. Okay, that has neither an intron nor an E&E, &E, and I would argue it just hasn't gotten its E&E &E yet. You know, we've, we've captured it mid-evolution. Um, but your, your question was? Well, why don't, you don't see any cases where they have both an intron and an ESC. We haven't seen any of those. Yeah. And so, do you have any thoughts on why that might be? Okay. Um, Nick Conrad, way back, did do experiments where he had both an E&E &E and an intron in beta globin. And it turned out that the intron was dominant in terms of its ability to export the RNA and get it out to the cytoplasm. And in his experiments then, that made no difference to the translation. The e, &E made no difference to the translation of the beta globin from those particular messages. So I think we don't really have an answer to your question. Yeah, okay, thanks. Right, Likewise, great talk. Uh, a couple of questions. So one is, does the E and E actually interfere with uh, nuclear export of an RNA? As far as we know, it doesn't. We thought at the beginning that it did, but the experiment that I just told you about, saying that having an intron is dominant, says that at least the E and E can't interfere with export if there's an intron there coupling to the export machinery the way we believe it happens with the vast majority of eukaryotic messenger RNAs. Okay, and I think you mentioned also that the E and E does stabilize RNAs in the cytoplasm as well as the nucleus. Well, that's according to Jeremy Willits because okay. he just saw more GFP. Now, whether there are any direct effects on translation or whether it's just that because it's more stable in the nucleus, you get more of it out into the cytoplasm and therefore um, you get more product, I don't know. Okay, okay. And I guess like Melissa probably, I'm thinking about the potential therapeutic applications. If you wanted to deliver an mRNA and you didn't want to have introns in it, to what degree sticking an E and E in there might help. And I guess that Go for remains it. to be the Go determined. for it. Try it. Yeah. I mean, we know it works in the nucleus because we put E and E's into pre-microRNAs, hmm. or sorry, pre-microRNAs, and see that you get much, much more of the microRNA, but that's all a nuclear process. Hmm. But we haven't gone so far as, in, as producing proteins, but therapeutically it certainly has lots of potential. Okay, thanks. Beautiful talk, John. Uh, so on this slide, again, there's actually two places where there's a zero and zero. One's right oh, underneath okay. the... okay. Thank you, thank you. I, I knew that there were... There's another zero, yeah. zero. I'm sorry, I couldn't S find those. So the question is, it seems that if you are without an intron and without an E&E &E as your... with your hypothesis, that there might be some effect on the prevalence of these particular yeah. um, transposons, and have you looked yeah. at that? Well, I think you'll um, realize that these species are not ones that are highly well studied. studied. Yeah. We barely <laughs> have annotated DNA genomes mm -hmm. from them. And um, so 
certainly in terms of gene expression, they have not been explored. Yeah. And that's, if somebody wants to do it, fine. And then the other question, um, the, the length of the NE, it seems a bit long for the, what you're hypothesizing, that maybe that it could be truncated down if one made an effort. Do you, have yeah. you tried anything well, like that? Well, I mean, we've made lots of mutations in this, those stacks of, of five. Right. And seen that any mutation uh, decreases its ability to stabilize. Mm. Now, there are many that only have four in these double domain E and E's and also, also some, of the, some of the singles. So we don't know whether those are just less efficacious, whether you could go to three, we, we haven't really tested that. I was thinking more in terms of the stems up, up, above and below. It seems like a lot of stem for holding that structure together. Yeah, um, the mallet one E and E is, is more stabilizing than the KSHV one with the, with the A's sliding along in all sorts mm -hmm. of different orientations. Clear that the mallet one is more stabilizing, but we haven't actually, that's a really good question, we haven't actually measured what the quantitative difference is between the two. Okay, thank you. Hi, Bruce. Hey, John. Beautiful talk. It was really interesting to see you found so many in the transposable elements, particularly ones that may have an RNA intermediate, so I didn't know if you had looked at reverse transcription do those things, you know, change anything with copying, reverse transcribing? Does it pause the oh, process and follow I, I bet there are all sorts of fantastic things that could be deciphered if one were to do those experiments, but no, we haven't. We can talk about it more later. What is known about uh, adenosine deaminase in such structures? Uh, can this be deaminated such structures or uh, when the A is Ooh. involved, whether it is in the, happening in the nucleus well, as well? Great question. Uh, I have no idea whether formation of a triple helix would mediate against deamination. I would suspect it would, but only the region that's in contact, which is pretty short. I have a, another question, kind of going back to the KSHV and the situation where you have this half million RNAs in each cell. What is that doing to the normal RNA transport and processing? Yeah. And do we know what uh, proteins in the nucleus may be yeah. binding to the yeah. ENEs? Okay. Um, this isn't our work. This is mostly the work of Britt Glanzinger at, at Berkeley. And um, what she's investigated in KSHV is the nuclear shutoff phenomenon, or I'm sorry, the host shutoff phenomenon, which, which basically just means that um, host messenger RNAs aren't translated and expressed as well as viral mRNAs in a KSHV infected cell. This has to do with a particular protein made by the virus called the SOX protein. And what's, what's come out from her work is that what the SOX protein does, and it's not known exactly how, is to relocate the cytoplasmic poly A binding protein largely to the nucleus. And when, it, when that happens and you have these half million copies of the pan RNA, what it does is to coat all those poly A tails with what is normally a cytoplasmic protein. And my favorite hypothesis, and I think we're getting evidence it's getting us there, is that what this high amount of pan-RNA does is to capture and sequester this cytoplasmic poly A binding protein, which would otherwise be deleterious to I don't know what processes, but some processes in the nucleus, and that by doing this, the virus then is able to um, effectively or more effectively discriminate against host messages in favor of viral messages. But this is all, this is all hypothesis. We're, we're working on exactly what the mechanism is. Okay. And, and a related question, is there a mutant virus that doesn't have the E&E &E, and what does that do to pathogenicity? Again, that, that answer will come very soon because we finally have those viruses. Okay, great. Well, I'd like to ask everyone to join me in thanking uh, Professor Stites very much.